Okay, hello, hello everybody. Um, really a uh, pleasure to, to, to meet you all and to, and to be a part of um, to, to what, you, what you guys are doing. Uh, my name is Ian and I look after the consumer business at Ledger. So what that means is, you know, selling uh, Ledger Nanos and, and Ledger, Ledger Live um, directly to customers, you know, to end users. We also have an enterprise business. Um, so, you know, that is the, if you, if you think about it, you know, as, as, you, as you know, more and more institutional um, players need security for their digital assets. So if you think about banks, but you could also think about um, things like, you know, brands, uh, like where I used to work, Louis Vuitton, they now also have digital assets and they need to protect those. Um, and, and so on the enterprise side, we also offer a, a solution which includes um, both hardware security and governance, um, which is interesting to think about. You know, when you think about if you're a company who holds digital assets, you know, the keys to those digital assets can't just be in the hands of, you know, a, a trustworthy IT person, right? They need to have governance so that, you know, for, you know, for the, 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 uh, the management of those digital assets, you know, might require more than one signature, um, you know, but it definitely requires governance and oversight. So we have both sides of our business, the consumer side and the enterprise side. And I look after the, the consumer side where you come to ledger.com, you buy uh, a Ledger Nano, you, 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 know, you take it, you install it. You, uh, I mean, you, you take it, you set it up, you install Ledger Live to manage it. Um, and then you also work with, you know, with other applications, it might be a, a third-party wallet um, like MetaMask or Frame or, you know, Zerion. Like there's a, there's a number of other, um, a number of other ways that you can then interface between the hardware wallet and um, you know, and and whatever it is you would you would like to do uh, with that. So um, Jean Baptiste will tell you know tell more about you know kind of the you know the technical pieces of 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 why this is necessary and how it works. Um, also happy to to answer any questions, but but maybe first I'll just give um, a little overview uh, of of the business itself, uh, and and you know from my perspective at a, at a very high level, you know why this exists. And and you know where it goes, um, you know. I, I, and I think you probably you know, given what, what you just gone through, you get uh, you know, in, in terms of your your internships, you understand that at a, at a, at a uh, you know, a, kind of the reason for Ledger to exist. But uh, but but I think as it fits into the overall um, environment and ecosystem, it's pretty interesting at, at this moment in time because. You know, the reality is, is that we have this new invention. We have critical digital assets, right? So you have, you know, digital things that you could lose. Um, you know, your, your value, as you know, is safe on the blockchain. Um, but, you know, it, you're, you have these, these moments where you're insecure, right? So at the moment of signing, you need to be sure that you know exactly what it is you're signing. Um, and you also need to make sure that that no one else has your private keys and can sign with you, or sign for you. And and as you know that I mean that that can be pretty tricky, right? Because you know if if you have that in a software wallet, then you're really limited to the um, the security level of of your operating system or browser or wherever that wallet lives, which which we know is a is a is a moving target. Um, and also has a level of complexity that, that, that makes it very difficult to be sure um, that, that things are safe or you're in a situation with, with custody, right? So you're on an exchange and now you're trusting your, your keys to, some, to somewhere else. So from my perspective, you know, a hardware wallet is the only solution which gives you kind of the full promise of this new invention of digital assets, right? Because... Um, you know, part of that promise is, is decentralization, which you don't get in the case of a, cust a custodian solution. And let's be honest, you know, we will have custodial solutions in the future, but we won't have that many of them. You know, we, we'll, you know, people might trust, you know, a Coinbase or a Kraken or a Binance uh, or even an FTX, um, but they're not going to trust, you know, 
Joe's Bitcoin exchange. You know, you just can't, you, we know now that, that, that you can't, you can't do that. But we also know that like one of the things that's incredible about, uh, about digital assets is, is the, the promise of decentralization. So the fact that, you know, we have, you know, 15% of all the world's cryptocurrency stored on ledger devices across the world is incredible. And it is stored in a decentralized way. So it's not like, that's not like saying Coinbase has 80 billion in assets under management. That's like saying collectively ledger users have 200 billion in assets under management. And, but that's, that's a collective number. And, um, and, you know, and actually architecturally more interesting than saying that's a honeypot that's all stored in one place, right? Like, you know, these are, this is actually protected in a, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a decentralized and, and distributed way. Um, so you, I think that, that, you know, with, with hardware wallets, you know, you have, first of all, dedicated hardware security, you have decentralization, um, you know, and, 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 and you have self-custody. And to me, this is, you know, what the actual promise of, of, of digital assets is. Um, and you do not get that, you do not get that from software wallets because you don't get security. You don't get that from exchanges because you, you don't get, um, yeah, you don't, you're not, you're not decentralized. Um, and you also, you know, don't get that even from a software wallet, uh, such as MetaMask in, in tandem with a hardware wallet, because then you are often blind signing. And, you know, what I mean by blind signing is where you sign a transaction, but you can't actually see exactly what that trans transaction is on your screen, um, which is another dangerous, a dangerous thing to do. So this is, this is really what we're trying to do is to bring security, ease of use, a platform approach, um, and, and, you know, really to bring, you know, the, the entire promise uh, of, of digital assets to bear. Um, you know, I think another, another thing that you can say, there's the, the Nano X, you know, in any industrial transformation, um, you always have a, uh, you know, a, a, you always have an unbundling and then ultimately a rebundling, right? So I came from the world of digital music where we unbundled the compact disc into, you know, 99 cent downloads. And then ultimately they were rebundled into subscription services. But I think that that's, that things always go that way. To me, this is the first unbundling. It's my web two hardware with my web three hardware. You know, ultimately you might have those rebundled. Okay, here's my iPod touch. Uh, you know, it could be a stand in for kind of the, the rebundling. But, um, you know, th this, is, this is where, you know, where, where things go, um, I think over time. But I think we have, we have many years still of this kind of unbundled approach where you have web two hardware plus web three hardware. And, you know, and this is, um, you know, and, 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 and this is kind of the starting point. Um, you know, I, th I think at a very high level, you know, that hopefully that gives you a sense. I guess what I'll what I'll what I'll do, and then, and then I'll turn it over to JB. Is um, I'll just say, you know, for, from our perspective, you know, we look at, at at you know multiple tracks of the business. So you know, we have the hardware business, um, and we have and, and we we have many improvements that are coming uh, in terms of the hardware. So um, Nano X is our flagship product now. Um, we will have, you know, kind of a, a new set of products, uh, coming beginning of next year, middle to end of next year, another, and then the beginning of 2023, another big, another big leap. So we have, you know, it's a hardware business. We have, you know, just like Apple or anyone else, we have a, a robust, um, hardware roadmap. Also though, on the software side, you know, to, to kind of hit those things of, of ease of use, uh, along with the security. You know, you you increasingly people want to be able to interact with, uh, you know, with with their assets. Um, so you know, it's you know, it's not just send and receive, but you know, it's it's doing other things. It's it's um, it's exchanging, it's buying, it's selling, um, and being able to do all of those things from you know from Ledger Live in a way that is super easy to use. You know, helps bring people on onto the platform. So we'd love to have um, to have you all you know in, in, involved in that. So. You know, in, in, the, in the Bitcoin world, you know, that might be lightning. It might be, um, you know, it, it might be, you know, people are building, you know, really interesting things, as you know, whether it's, you know, NFTs on top of, uh, of Bitcoin, et cetera. So, you know, it'd be, it'd be great to have, you know, have, have your involvement in, you know, developing what, what we call uh, live apps over time. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there.
uh, and and let JB tell you you know more of the the specifics, and then I'll I mean I'll be here for for questions if you have at the end. Okay, thank you, Yen. I'm. I was trying to configure my, my microphone. I have a new laptop. I don't know if the, the sound is good. Yeah, sounds perfect. Okay, great. So let's start. I have a few slides. I, I will share my screen now. You see something, right? Yep, we see it. Okay, perfect. So let's start. Uh, so uh, as Jan said, I'm, I'm Jean-Baptiste. Uh, JB, I, I work at Ledger. I, I lead the, the team responsible for, for the security of the products developed at, at Ledger. And we'll, I will talk to you about hardware wallets, about the security model and how we improved the security of, of the wallets uh, over time. So I lead a team of eight people. Uh, we have two main activities, finding vulnerabilities in our products and fi fixing, fix fixing them uh, during the development phase. And second, uh, creating tools or methods to improve product security, have a better architecture and so on. So uh, half of us uh, work in software security. Some of you probably have some experience about that or at least some knowledge in this area. The other half, is specialized in hardware security, so you may know less about this uh, this topic, and I'm going to talk about it uh, a bit today. So what else I'm going to talk about? Um, first, I'm going to talk about hardware wallets, how they are designed and what they are mean to, to resist to. Then, um, ledger devices are embedded devices, so I will explain how we added uh, software security to this embedded hardware world. And this is quite a challenge. Uh, I will then detail uh, why Ledger devices use secure elements, despite all of their constraints. Uh, I'll talk about that later. And finally, I will show attacks on wallets that do not have uh, a secure element. Okay. So uh, I will introduce my talk. I, I wanted to introduce my talk by presenting different types of wallets that you can use to protect your cryptocurrencies. Jan uh, mentioned mentioned them, uh, so I will make made a, a quick resume. So what what we can already see is that we can separate, uh, as Jan said, uh, we can separate them into um, exchanges, exchanges, and the rest. With exchanges, you do not own the keys to to send transactions, and the, as uh, Jan mentioned, you you delegate your security, and you delegate not only your security, but but. You delegate, uh, actually, you, you can only perform operations that are authorized to you by the exchange. It's a bit uh, like, a, like a bank uh, in, a, in a way. Otherwise, you own your keys. And I consider that we, we want to own our keys. So if, if you want to manage your keys yourself, you basically have two options. Software wallets like Exodus, Electrum, or other wallets like uh, those we make at Ledger, or Trezor, or Cold Card wallets, and so on. So, the main advantage of software wallets is, our, is that they are fairly easy to use. You, you just need the software. The downside is the security, as, as you had mentioned. The keys are stored usually on, in a file on your computer or on, on your phone. So the security of the wallet depends on the security of your computer or, of your, or your phone. And uh, malware will, will be usually able to, to extract them. So this is something known uh, for a long time. but. Uh, People are not really aware of this, so I, I, I made a short uh, I made a short demo to, to show you why uh, a software wallet is less secure than, than a hardware wallet. For this video, I, I made a small program that acts like a malware that will spy the Electrum wallet while uh, while a user enters his password. So the malware will retrieve the password and use it to to decrypt the, the content of the configuration configuration file of the wallet. It will then extract the seed and display it on the screen. So a real malware would have sent it to a remote server controlled by an attacker who would have retrieved the seed and uh, would have stolen the funds of, uh, of an attacker, right? So uh, actually, hardware wallets are designed specifically to deal with this type of attacks. So to keep the user secrets, uh, the, the private keys, the seed, and uh, they use them to send transactions. So 
private keys, your secrets never reach your PC or, or your phone. Uh, they also provide a kind of uh, secure display. Uh, so the wallet receives the whole transaction, it parses it, extracts the interesting fields, and shows them to, to the user. So if we consider that the wallet code is secure, then the details of the transaction, which are displayed on the screen, are correct. And we can then compare them, to, we can compare them to those uh, which are displayed, displayed on, the, on, the, on the computer, on the software wallet on the computer. So even, even if your computer is fully compromised, you will be able to fully review the transaction before you sign it. So there's no blind signing, you, you, you really uh, know what you sign. Uh, finally, some, some hardware wallets are protected against uh, hardware attacks, physical attacks. So if the first threat countered by hardware wallets is attacked by malware or by a hacker or on the computer, some wallets such as uh, Legion Nano, NanoS, NanoX or cold card wallets are protected against uh, physical attacks, also, hardware attacks. So if you lose your wallet, you, you leave it on your desktop or you break it, an attacker won't be able to, to do anything with it and your phones will stay safe. And uh, personally, honestly, I leave my wallets on my desk, at home, at work, all the time, and I don't feel like I'm taking a risk by, by doing this. So uh, I'm going to, to digress a bit uh, on software security, of, uh, of the software security of, of the Bitcoin Core pro project, actually. So many of you will be working on, on critical projects uh, during the, the summer of Bitcoin uh, from, from a security point of view. Uh, Bitcoin Core, and I also saw a project related to SecP 256Q1. And I checked the project repository and found in the readme file this statement. So, testing code is uh, testing at code, code review is the bottleneck for development. Uh, we get more and more, uh, we get more pull requests that we can review and, uh, and, and test on, on short notice. And it's, uh, and it's true, uh, often for, for sensitive projects, uh, security and testing are a bottleneck. And uh, why? Uh, particularly because in an in open, open source project, actually, uh, in, in all the projects, actually, it's more sim stimulating for a developer, for a contributor to write new features than, than to review other people's code, uh, finding, uh, finding bugs in other, people and so on, uh, other people's code, and, and so on. So, then how do you verify that your software is secure? Uh, it's a hard task. How do you know that you've spent enough time assessing your own security? Uh, it's a task that takes a lot of time. Uh, you're not sure of anything. And uh, one, of the, one of the real metrics, unfortunately, is that when a hacker manages to find an exploit and a vulnerability, uh, manage to find a vulnerability and manage to exploit it in your product, then you have failed. But this is a uh, hard to spot before uh, before that that occurs, right? So, uh, how does uh, Bitcoin Core ensures the security of the project? Uh, first, we can see that security seems strongly linked to to testing. Project owners insist on writing unit tests, integration tests. There's also a manual QA phase, which in inevitably uh, takes a lot of time. Um, to, to, speed up, uh, to speed up this process, uh, security tools are used. Uh, I noticed that the project is registered on Coverty Scan, uh, which is a powerful static uh, code analysis tools, uh, tool. But um, the tool is, is not fully integrated in the CI, and it, look, it looks like there's no regular scan. So it's normal because looking at scan reports take a, takes a lot of time and it doesn't surprise me that there, are, there aren't regular, uh, regular review of, of, the, of the scans. I also know that uh, Clang Static Analyzer, which is another static analysis tool, is, is used. Uh, actually, we used it at Ledger a few months ago and it allowed us to find a, a bug in the test of the SecP256 k one library. So we informed the, the developers of uh, Bitcoin Core at that time. And they seemed very interested in, in integrated in integrating it to the to the CI, but it doesn't seem to be done at the moment. But maybe it will it will be done in, a, in the near future. And um, finally, the project is also is, is also continuously fuzzed uh, thanks to the integration with OSS Fuzz, uh, a project uh, launched by Google. So fuzzing uh, consists in sending malformed data to, to a program to try to crash it. 
to crush it and to find memory corruption, like buffer overflows, stack overflow, heap overflows, and so on. So you send hundreds of millions of malformed data to an application, uh, trying to get the maximum code coverage on, on, your, on your code, maximum coverage on your, on your code and wait for it to crash. So this is a very efficient method to find vulnerabilities and it can be automated. Uh, I know the, the Python core project uh, created 60 first targets, 60 programs to be, to be fuzzed into your, into your project and fuzzing is running continuously on Google, ser Google servers uh, looking for new bugs all the time. So that, that's it uh, for, from what I saw for, for security, uh, testing, manual QA, static analysis, continuous, continuous fuzzing. And this is really, really, really great for, for an open source project. Um, uh, let's come back to hardware wallets and you will understand why I talked about the security practice of Bitcoin Core uh, a bit later. So other wallets, uh, they all have the same role, but they are, not, they are not designed in the same way. The simplest model is uh, the one chosen by Trezor. Uh, on Trezor, uh, there's a single chip, a standard microcontroller, here uh, STM32. It's a chip uh, which is designed for embedded device, devices uh, with a lot of uh, flash memory, RAM uh, and RAM, and a TRNG, a hardware, hardware random number generator. And uh, using this kind of chips uh, make, makes it possible to build a completely open source wallet and open, open hardware, like uh, what Trezor does. That's, that's good for them. This is uh, their model. On the other hand, uh, there are ledger, on the other side, you, you have ledger devices. They don't have one, but two chips, a standard microcontroller like mm -hmm. Trezor does, but, unique, uh, but only for Bluetooth and USB connections and a secure element that does everything else. So basically all the application code runs on the secure element. The advantage of secure elements is that they are protected against physical attacks. Uh, it, it's like the same chip you have on your, on your credit card, for example. And uh, one of the drawbacks of secure elements is that they are not easily accessible and uh, their specifications are under NDA. This is why we cannot make the operating, operating system of uh, our devices open source. Uh, on the other hand, uh, anyone can develop uh, an application on Ledger Nano and make it open source. All the parts which are under NDA are abstracted and are protected like by the operating system. So it's uh, an open platform run, running on the closed close source operating system, right? And uh, in the middle, there are call card wallets, like this, this kind of wallets. So they have a kind of secure element which is not really a secure element, we call it secure memory. So in fact, all call card, call card firmware runs on their microcontroller and sensitive data, uh, like, data like, like the seed and private keys are stored into the secure element, secure memory. So sensitive data are retrieved by the micro, microcontroller uh, from, the, from the secure memory when the user enters his pin. And uh, when a transaction is signed, the secure element does nothing. Actually, it's the MC, uh, microcontroller which signs the transaction by itself. So this model is more robust against physical attacks than, than the one of, of Trezor. And it allows to keep its firmware completely open source uh, as this uh, as the secure memory is not under NDA. Uh, so uh, secure elements provide physical protection, but they are, they are not as powerful as standard microcontrollers. So let's look at the specifications of, of the Nano S, for example. This is a PCB of a Nano X, but Nano S is quite similar. So the processor is, is slow, 28 megahertz. It has a total of uh, 10 kilobytes of RAM. So actually 28 megahertz is uh, slower than, than the first PC I got uh, like 30 years ago. My PC 30 years ago had more, more RAM also. And uh, we have reserved, uh, on, on this 10 kilobytes, we have reserved six for the operating system and four, uh, so only four are, uh, are available for applications, for, uh, for application developers. So generally, we, we split them in two, three kilobytes for data and one kilobyte for the stack. So this is very, very limited, very constrained environment. Then there's no, there's no debug interface. This is secure element, so you cannot debug. So uh, to if you want to debug, you, you have to buy simulators based on FPG FPGAs, but they are very expensive. 
uh, not very practical to use. Uh, I, I tried to use them. It, uh, it took me a lot of time and I was really not satisfied with it. So with them, you do actually uh, hardware debugging, which is not convenient. And uh, finally, programs are executed directly from, from the flash memory. They are, they are not lo loaded into RAM. Each instruction is fetched and executed by the CPU uh, from the flash memory. So there is no memory management unit, uh, no address translation. Everything is uh, very static. So uh, what are the consequences for, for security? So the CPU is slow. So fuzzing. Uh, so if you want to, if you want to try fuzzing, where, where, when you when you have to send hundreds of millions of entries to, to a program, this is just not possible. So in addition, in our devices, we are no fault fault handler. So as as soon as a problem appears, uh, the device freezes and it must be physically restarted. So um, in addition, uh, there's no debug interface. So even if you find a crash, you you won't easily find out what caused the problem. Uh, so this is first first problem. Uh, moreover, there's uh, very little memory available, uh, as I said. So security features that have even the slightest impact of memory uh, on memory are very difficult to, en to enforce uh, because developers want to to have the most uh, the biggest amount of memory available. So there's no dynamic allocator. You cannot call malloc uh, or new, for example. That means that we cannot use scripting languages where, where you where you have to allocate dynamically objects and so on, uh, and you, we are restricted to lower level lower level languages like like C, C code, and for security we know that C is not not the best language. So, how do we secure that? Uh, we wanted to to automate stuff as much as possible uh, for what it's for what is possible in the embedded world. Uh, we wanted to find bugs without manual manual intervention. So for that, we used uh, static analysis tools. In fact, uh, the same ones that seem to be used by, by the Bitcoin Core project. So Covert Scan, uh, Clang Static Analyzer, and we are we are also looking at CodeQL at the, at the moment, which is a um, uh, which is a so, so static analysis tool um, acquired by by GitHub uh, a few months ago. And as I said before, um, security is tightly linked to testing. And this is where the pain comes because we really need to test our code and this is complicated. Uh, if, you, if you write unit tests on hardware, uh, you can test them in software uh, by mocking a few functions, but to do complete functional tests, you need hardware. So we have built uh, remotely controllable nano devices so we, we can send them data, we can press buttons remotely, we can read the text sent to the screen, and so on. So this is enough to perform a functional tests, basic functional tests, right? But the problem is that this is only available to Ledger employees, not to third-party developers, and we want our devices to, to be an open platform, and that doesn't scale. We, we cannot continuously test hundreds of applications and the operating system, uh, every application on every version of the oper operating system and so on using this this simply doesn't scale. So how to solve this? Um, our idea was to to write uh, Speculus, a full emulator of uh, of our devices. So it's based on QEMU, an open source uh, machine emulator. It has a GDB stub thanks to QEMU, so so we can debug applications uh, directly on on the computer. And around this emulator, we built a test framework that we can embed in our CI. So it allows it allows us to do fuzzing on PC, which is faster than, than on secure element, really faster than, than on secure element, despite the emulation layer. And to generate complete crash reports, uh, which allow you to and us to easily correct the bugs uh, you, you discover. Uh, finally, it's completely open source, uh, not under NDA, and therefore available to, to third party developers. And we try to integrate it in each of our projects. So in fact, uh, Speculus was initially written by, by the Donjon, by, by the security team, uh, but it's now used by all the application developers. Um, it was uh, a tool designed for security purposes to do testing, fuzzing, and so on, debugging, but it makes application development much, much easier. And uh, as a result, 
uh, most of uh, every application, every all the application developers are at Ledger never use the, the, the device during development. They use only Speculous and they validate their code on a real device uh, at, at uh, the last stage of de development for, for final testing, actually. Uh, this is not, uh, we also push for other mitigations. We wrote SDK in Rust, which is a memory safe language, much more secure than, than C, I'd say. Uh, so we built a SDK on, on a secure element, which is a, which I think is a, is a first. And we have also hardening uh, countermeasures to, to prevent exploitation of whole class of bugs, but I'm not going to talk about that here. So finally, uh, despite all the constraints uh, re related to the use of a secure element, we managed to reach uh, development methods that are, that are quite similar to those of a standard software development, right? So one may, one may wonder why we choose to use a secure element. It has a, a lot of constraints, but what for actually? So the first one is remote attestation. So user can, users can transparently verify that their dev device is genuine, that it was manufactured by, by Ledger. So uh, a genuine check is run, for example, every time you install an app on your device. So this is possible because each device uh, embeds a unique key pair signed during production using our own HSMs. And this key is used to pr prove uh, device authenticity and nobody can extract it. So we don't need uh, like uh, sec security stickers on, on, on the box of, of, of the Ledger Nano to make sure this is uh, authentic. Just you plug it, run Ledger Live, and if it's rec recognized, you know it's a, it's a, it's a real one. Uh, second, we can deliver applications to users in a, in a secure way. Uh, to install an application, your device must create a secure channel with Ledger HSMs with our, with our backend. So it's an end-to-end -end encrypted and authenticated channel. So you are sure that the app you install has not been modified and, and uh, it's safe. And uh, finally, it's, uh, and this is the most important reason actually, it ensures that if you lose your device, uh, your funds stay safe. So, so no one, uh, to, to our knowledge, is able to, uh, to unlock an Aino without knowing, knowing the pin code, even us. So as I, as, as I told you, I, I'm not afraid if someone steals my, my Aino, I know, I know nothing will happen. So uh, I will now explain uh, the problems that you can encounter on devices which don't, do not have a, a secure element. So I start, I start with, uh, with side channel attacks. So these are passive hardware attacks. They do not modify uh, the behavior of the component uh, you try to attack. So actually, uh, it's a kind of attack. Uh, to, to, to attack the component, you, you just listen to it. You record its, it's uh, power consumption or, or its uh, electro electromagnetic emanations. So the main idea of these attacks is that the, the consumption of the chip depends on its activity. So for example, um, when a component performs an encryption, its consumption can vary uh, according to the encryption key. And sometimes we are able to recover this key just by analyzing uh, this consumption. It's like, uh, you can think of a burglar who tries to, to open a safe uh, by listening to it with stethoscope, right? It's exactly the same thing. Uh, so this type of attacks has been known since the 90s and uh, it's difficult to, to protect uh, against it on the uh, on the standard standard microcontroller. Um, it's often easy to find a correlation between the data and the power consumption on, the, on these on these chips. Uh, so thanks to uh, using these attacks, we've been able, for for example, to to find the, the pin code of uh, Trezor wallets, KeepKey wallets, and the secret keys of many devices, not necessarily. Uh, hardware wallets, a lot of uh, IoT devices, uh, embedded devices, and so on. And uh, actually, the secure elements are specifically, specifically designed, uh, among other things, to counter these attacks. Uh, to do this, for example, they insert uh, noise, uh, voltage noise, in order to, to prevent these variants, variants to be characterized. Um, also, uh, they introduce uh, random timing variations so that correlations are harder to find because of the um, discrepancy be between the timings between uh, different traces. 
so I will talk more about uh, active attacks now, actually. Uh, so that was for side channel attacks. Uh, I just uh, mentioned them briefly. And I'll not talk about uh, active attacks, false attacks. I will present an attack on, on a secure memory, the one which is used by, by cold card wallets. Uh, so for that part, for that part, I will talk about uh, laser attacks. So as a recall, uh, to protect secrets in the embedded world, you have basically three options. The one uh, followed by Trezor, uh, since you, you put sensitive data directly into the flash memory uh, of, of your microcontroller. Uh, you lock your memory against reading. And uh, this is a cheap solution, but this is not very resistant to physical attacks. There are a lot of presentation uh, on, on that topic and you can consider it's uh, broken devices uh, from a physical security point of view. Another solution is to use secure element, like what with what leisure. And there's a third family of components used by call card. And uh, the idea is that these components are more open, but they contain security mechanisms, uh, as I said before. They are fairly open components. You, you can purchase them freely. And we started the study because we find this kind of chip interesting, but we wanted to know uh, their exact level of, secu of security. Uh, so the name of the component is ATECC 508A. Uh, so let's start. Th this component has a very small uh, software attack surface. Uh, actually, you can send you can send it a, a very small number of commands with a well-defined format. So there's very little chance of finding uh, any software vulnerabilities in it, especially because uh, the firmware is secret. There's no way to recover it. Uh, so we are really in a black box context. Um, the component is protected against some hardware attacks. Uh, there are voltage glitch, voltage glitch detectors, which is a fairly common way to break the security of uh, insecure microcontrollers. You send um, a uh, big amount of uh, a big voltage to, during a very short amount of time to, to try to inject fault into the circuit. Uh, there is also a metal shield on the surface of the, of the component. So you, with this, you prevent attackers to, to probe with a very thin needle the internal signal of, of the circuit uh, uh, that, uh, that, will, that will help uh, attackers to, to try to extract key from, 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 these, uh, from these signals. So this is not possible because of, because of this chill. But the data sheet does not mention any protection against uh, laser attacks. So we thought uh, there were maybe some tests to do uh, on that side. So we, we take out our, our laser. Um, so what you see on the picture on the left uh, is an electronic chip, which has been prepared to be attacked by, by a laser. Uh, what you see on the right is a full laser test bench that we built in, in the donjon, in the team. Uh, the laser on the left is connected to, to an oscilloscope that measures the electric con consumption of, of the component and to an infrared camera that can see like a microscope inside the component. And we can shoot with the laser at very precise moments at specific locations of the, of the chip to produce faults and to bypass the security of the component. So to start, there are uh, two things to know. Uh, first, uh, silicon is, is transparent to, to infrared. Uh, so with, with an infrared camera, we can take a photo of the circuit, uh, as you can see on the images on the right. And the second, integrated circuits are photosensitive. If you eliminate a transistor, uh, it can make it conductive. So if we do it uh, while the program is running, we, we can introduce, thanks, thanks to the laser, computation errors. On the right, you see the two photos. Uh, the top one is a part of a secure element. You can see uh, small white squares on this photo. These are actually uh, light detectors and they will trigger an alarm if a laser shot is detected. Uh, below, you, you see uh, ATCC 508A and a priori, there are no light detectors. So at that point, uh, we really think laser is the right way to, to attack the chip. Uh, so we know that uh, thanks to the laser, we can produce faults in the code, but we don't know the code at all. We are in a black box context, so you have to make assumptions. Uh, the, there are, imagine the case where we want to sign a message with a key, which is a protected resource. And to use this key, you need to be authenticated. This is how uh, the cold card wallet works actually. So this is not uh, really imagination. Uh, so if so, 
the program will switch to the top branch, read the key from the app ROM, sign the message, and return the signature. Otherwise, it will directly uh, return an error uh, you see uh, on the bottom. So of course, we will want to go to the top branch. For that, we know that we will have to shoot here uh, to inverse the, the condition, right? But in fact, we, we don't know precisely where and when the shoot will be fired. So if we shoot at a bad place, we can modify the transaction, transaction data. And if we, if we shoot too late, we will shoot the function that returns the signature and won't have any answer. Um, so we will already try, we will first try to answer one of those questions, when to shoot. For this, we, we, use, an, we use an oscilloscope. Uh, you have to remember that the power consumption of a chip depends on its activity, right? So in this graph, uh, you see two traces. The first one in, in white in white is a trace of a signature request made while being authenticated. Uh, the second one is a request without authentication. You see that on the first trace, the activity is more important. We observe in particular a series of, of peaks uh, which, which is in fact correspond to the reading of the key in the app ROM. Uh, on the second trace, however, it's pretty flat, nothing happens. Uh, what's interesting when you compare these two traces is to see a div diver divergence uh, up to a certain point. Um, they are aligned perfectly, then uh, they diverge here. So, we thought this was at this exact moment that the program checks whether we have authenticated ourselves or not. That, therefore, it's that at that precise moment that we must shoot. Uh, so the, the second question is where to shoot. Uh, since uh, silicon is transparent to infrared, uh, as I said, we can create a full map of the chip. Here we, we observe it with a microscope and an infrared camera. At the top, we see three memory areas. Uh, a prom, uh, the ROM, and the RAM. And at the bottom, it seems to be the analog parts. The middle is uh, the code of the processor and the peripherals and so on. So it's quite difficult to know what it does exactly without more information for, from the manufacturer, but it's a first, uh, first approach. And this is on these memory areas that we will shoot with a laser more or less uh, randomly. Um, here is uh, the little red dot that you see in the center of the screen is the, the laser. It has a strong power and you can see that it's quite small. So you, you can shoot uh, with uh, quite a high precision uh, on the chip. Mm. So to perform the attack, we have developed a, so uh, a software. It allows us to draw areas in which uh, we want to shoot, right? So this is a fully, con uh, the laser is fully controlled by, by your computer. And uh, the, the computer will, will uh, create random passes uh, so that the laser uh, can shoot randomly into the, these areas. And we wait, uh, we launch a campaign, which can take a lot of time, several hours, maybe several days. And we wait until we manage to sign a message uh, without be, being authenticated. After that, we know that uh, we have succeeded and we know the exact location in which we have to shoot to, to replace the attack again. So this allowed us to extract the key of a, of a cold card wallet, for example. So does it really work? Uh, you can ask yourself if, if I'm telling the truth of, or if this is a science fiction or things like that. In fact, it actually works. Uh, it's an attack that was presented at uh, the Black Hat conference uh, in 2020 by my colleague Olivier Erivo. And uh, it allows to extract the keys, uh, the secrets of, of this chip in less than two minutes. So it's considered really feasible and realistic. Uh, you can find the, the presentation of YouTube if, if you want to see the, the full presentation on it. Um, then Colcard and Microchip, uh, the man manufacturer of the chip, uh, had been warned long before. We, we, we warned them be before publishing the attack. So Colcard re released a new wallet with a new chip. We broke it again uh, and we presented uh, the attack again at the Black Hat conference two months ago. Uh, then Microchip released a new vers version of this chip, uh, which is now used by new uh, version of the la latest wallet of uh, Colcard. Uh, we haven't stopped our research, but it, can be, it cannot be disclosed and published at, at that time. Um, so we can say 
uh, actually, as a conclusion, I can say that even if that's not perfect, this architecture is as a quite a high resistance against physical attacks, even if we are able to break it, uh, compared to wallets uh, make, uh, made of a single microcontroller like uh, Trezor ones. The drawback of this attack obviously is, is the cost, uh, because a laser test bench costs uh, quite a, uh, some money. Uh, so that's it. Um, as a conclusion, I, I present you the security architecture of various hardware wallets. Uh, our job is to assess the security, uh, their security, and we believe that our devices achieve a very good level of security against physical attacks. But uh, as we have seen, using a secure element makes it difficult to write truly secure code. So we therefore had, had to do a lot of work to bring our wallets to the state of the art in software security and to bring uh, actually software uh, state of the art software security to the world of secure elements. Um, this is uh, one of, I'd say, one of our major achievements uh, in the team. On your side, uh, the, the takeaway on your side is that uh, actually you have the chance to work on a software-only project. So this is really great for security, I'd say, for, for software developers at least. So even if you are not a security expert, you can write secure code. So uh, if you carefully test it, if you write, write unit tests and functional tests, you can make sure that will improve the security of, uh, of your code. This will also help, help people from, from security team to ease their analysis, right? Uh, we often review code without any test, any functional test, and so on. This is really just a, a pain because we just first, before perf performing the security review, we had to do quite a, like a reverse engineering of, of the source code, and this is a, just we we lose our time uh, on this and finally uh, i want to say that review reviewing code from other developers will make you improve your own code you will make you progress and this is as important as writing the code yourself so uh, please review the code from from your friends for, for your colleagues and on your projects and um that's it for me uh, I'm ready to to answer uh, to answer all of your questions. I hope you you enjoyed the the con conversation and thanks for for your attention. Thanks, JB. I'm happy to answer questions too. Thanks, Laurie and JB. That was fantastic. I learned so much more about the microcomputing architecture, security, and how all of those relate to Bitcoin. And maybe I can start with one question and I would encourage the students here um, to share their questions on the chat. Um, but my question is just around that. So for a student who, whose interest lies at the intersection of you know, microcomputers, security and, and Bitcoin, uh, how should uh, they think about a career in, in that particular area at that particular intersection? Uh, if you know if you're a student with some programming experience, some computer science background right now, um, how should we think about that? Well, I mean, I, I think at a at a very high level, it's a, it's a great time to um, you know to to have that and, ha and and be interested in that. I mean, there's there's going to be a lot of activity going on in this. I mean, if you just think about how big this industry is going to be. And then the fact that you know the, the the devices that we have in our hands and on our desktops, you know, fundamentally don't secure that. And then you think about that we have this this kind of as I said in the beginning, this this unbundled present where you have your Web two hardware side by side with your Web three hardware, but ultimately there will be a rebundling. You know, there's there's a lot of um, there, there's a lot of possibility there. Um, you know, we, we, we have, you know, we're, we're hiring like crazy at, at, at Ledger and, and really anybody in this space is going to be, is going to be looking, um, you know, looking for people as well. So I think there's, there's a ton, there, there's a ton to be done, but I don't know, JB, if you have, you know, kind of more specifically how to think about it and, and, and what, and what people might focus on. Okay. So the answer was the intersection between, uh, like computer programming and, uh, Hardware architecture and things like that, or uh, maybe I, I didn't uh, fully understood the, the question. Sorry. All right. So, so for someone who who is interested in working on hardware wallets, right? So hardware wallets. I mean, the way I look at them, they are at the intersection of, you know, 
microcomputers and then security and then you know in the world of cryptocurrency so um you know they really form this this way to secure digital assets this unique way of securing digital assets and for someone who wants to work on it work on that technology um what skills uh, sh- should they should they sort of uh, try to um acquire um and what are the opportunities in space what are the major problems that you look at that you that you think uh, are around for someone to sol- go and solve them okay okay so uh I really encourage, so as I said, uh, Ledger Nano are uh, op- Ledger Nano devices are open platforms. So you can try, ju- you can just try by, by yourself and start developing apps. We provide an open source SDK. You take your, your favorite c- cryptocurrency and you try to implement uh, an application for, for, for this currency, or you try to, to improve uh, the ex- existing applications and so on. This is a good start. And for that, what, what do you need? You, d- you need uh, a, a knowledge in C code, uh, like um, low level code. You, you can also write your, your application in Rust. And actually, uh, as we abstract all the hardware stuff and so on, you just have to, to be um, like a low level system developer and that's it. I think it's enough. Uh, if you want to do uh, more, even lower level stuff, uh, then uh, yeah, you can come to Ledger so that, so that you, you can look at uh, hardware design, um, firm, firmware design, and so on. Uh, this is actually difficult to, to work on that side uh, if you're not I- inside a company uh, poly- 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 policing that, that kind of devices. But uh, as Jan say, we, we are hiring, so uh, I'm sure this is an uh, interesting job for, <laughs> for people like you. Amazing, thank you. Uh, thanks for that. So, uh, Shivaram has asked in the chat. Um, yes. Maybe I can I can I can read out his question. Uh, it was mentioned in the slides that Ledger Nano X is partially open source. Aren't most cryptographic methods are open source so that people can try to attack and fail and hence proving its security? Maybe you want yes. to sort of shed some light on that aspect about Ledger Nano X. This this is a very good question, and actually I'm really in favor on uh, open sourcing all of our cryptographic code. Uh, this is not the case at the moment. Uh, we have, I think, uh, now. I, I don't I, I don't know if it's has, it has been already done or, or not, but it will be done really in the near future if it's not done yet. Um, we have open source all the code we can we can open source. Uh, what I mean is that uh, some of our code. Uh, manipulates uh, hardware accelerators, cryptographic uh, hardware accelerators, which is under NDA, like uh, basic mathematical operations, like additions of, on big numbers, multiplication on big numbers, things like that. This uh, is accelerated and actually protected by, by our security elements. Uh, these operations are under NDA. We cannot prov- provide the code of this. Uh, we can just uh, provide interfaces, open source interfaces to, to, so that you can you are able to, to perform a multiplication of on big, big numbers, uh, sc- scalar multiplication on, um, on an elliptic curve and things like that. You are right. Uh, I, like, I would like to open source all of our code. Uh, this is not possible for, for legal reason, actually. Um, and I, I don't fully agree with the fact that open source libraries are more secure than, uh, than closed source one. I mean, uh, for example, the Microsoft Crypto API was closed source for, for years. And actually, uh, I have audited, audited it in, in Blackbox really a, a lot of time. And it was really well written. And there was no major problem on it, uh, actually, uh, much less than, uh, for, let's say, open cell. But um, philosophically, I think it's better to, to open source uh, our code. We, we do what we can. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Interesting. So it, it seems like it's probably because of the, it's not the technical reason for Ledger to not have its uh, you know libraries or software open source, but more so because of the legal contract that you have. Yes. Exactly. Awesome. So Sandeepan is asking if someone observes the number of times you are clicking which button after plugging in the Ledger, they should be able to make out the pin and force snatch it from us. Is that a vulnerability? Yes, uh, exactly, and this is a vulnerability. But uh, actually, 
when you enter your, your pin, uh, I don't I don't have a nano here. Uh, actually, the digits are randomized, so uh, it doesn't start with a zero. Uh, it starts with a random random digit. Uh, 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 so it will start with a six, for example. So you you have to press a, a random num num number of uh, of times you, your buttons. So yes, the pin pad is randomized, so, so you cannot uh, perform this kind of this kind of attack. But this is a this is a good point. Uh, it was it was the case uh, in a very old versions of Nano S, and this has been fixed uh, for a long time now. Cool. All right, Sandeepan has another question. Does the signing verification happen on STM32, the sector element, or does the microcontroller read out the private key and sign it itself? Okay, so uh, the, the microcontroller is the STM32. Actually, the secure element is ST31 or ST33. STM32 is a microcontroller insecure, right? Uh, so all the cryptographic operations uh, are done on the secure element. The, the, the microcontroller never uh, has access to the private keys, fortunately, and uh, this is totally not the security model of, uh, of, of logic devices. So you can break fully the, 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 the STM32, you will never get access to the, to the private keys. All right. Aditya has another question. What is the standard procedure used by big companies like Coinbase and Binance to secure so many keys? And what happens if they lose it or if it gets leaked? Okay, uh, I don't work in, a, in such exchanges. I, I, actually, I guess they have also an internal security team that perform, uh, I, I think also uh, regular external pen tests. Uh, but, um, if you have if you have uh, a great amount of money, you have also skilled skilled attackers uh, who face you. Uh, so this is a let's say a cat and mouse game, and uh, this is actually they are very difficult task. Actually, I think I, I sleep better than the security team at uh, at Coinbase and uh, in Binance. Um, if they okay. lose, uh, if they if they data gets leaked, uh, I don't know what happens. Uh, we've seen in the past exchange getting hacked, uh, it was not that good for, for customers. And uh, actually, uh, you can maybe recover your funds thanks to insurance, but uh, I have no idea about this. Maybe, maybe Jan, you, you have a better answer than me, but... All right, uh, cool. Okay, so Jan just left, so... <laughs> Ian had to jump off. Uh, so we have, <laughs> we have Sandeepan with, with one question. Does the pin stay in the secure element or the microcontroller? Okay, so uh, I, uh, I didn't know if I mentioned that. So uh, the screen and the buttons of on Legend and Wix are directly uh, uh, connected to the secure element, right? So uh, the, the information uh, of the buttons and on, on the screen is totally managed by, by the secure element. And when, when you enter your pin, uh, all, everything happens on the secure element. Actually, I, as I said, the microcontroller is only used for uh, USB and Bluetooth. Uh, you can totally disconnect the, the microcontroller if you, if you don't need a USB and Bluetooth. Actually, you, you can do anything without it. Uh, but you, you will see that you can, if you disconnect the microcontroller, you will still be able to, to enter your pin and so on. So everything is on, on the secure element. Cool. Okay. <laughs> All right, so this is the final question that we'll take um, because we are already over time. Uh, let's go for it. Just, can someone reprogram the microcontroller to always send to some another address while the screen shows the one the computer sent? Hmm. Okay, so uh, as I said, um, the, the, the screen is directly connected to the secure element, so you cannot manipulate the screen. Uh, from the micro microcontroller, okay? This is an architectural change uh, since uh, an arch architectural difference between the Nano S and the Nano X. Actually, uh, on the Nano S, uh, due to technical restrictions, because there were not enough pins on the secure element of, of the Nano S, uh, the, the display was uh, managed uh, by, by the micro my microcontroller. We knew it was a bad thing, and we we uh, spent a lot of, lot of time to to secure that part. 
on the non uh, you really have to compromise the security element to be able to, to drive the screen. So I, I think, so this is actually not possible uh, by attacking just the microcontroller. On the nine OS, uh, if you manipulate uh, the microcontroller, technically uh, you are you you can technically you can uh, modify the, the display and try to trick a user uh, by uh, validating a, a wrong address. This I say technically because we we due to due to some technical limitations also on the micro, microcontroller, uh, which is which has a very limited amount of memory. Uh, uh, we are able to, to check uh, the whole content of the microcontroller memory uh, in real time uh, from the secure elements and make sure that it has not been modified. Uh, we tried to attack uh, this mechanism uh, regularly, actually, and we were not able to break it. So I'd say that philosophically, this is not as, sec as secure as, um, as a NanoX, but NanoS still offers a, a good security and we we have not been able internally to, to break the, the display on, uh, on NanOS. So this is a, a good point. Uh, I don't know, uh, I'm really not sure this is, uh, this is feasible uh, on, a, on, a, uh, on a, if you have a recent uh, firmware version of the NanOS. Uh, so. Awesome. Okay, uh, I have one final question yeah. um, and that's around Lightning. You know, a lot of folks here have worked on Lightning projects. I would love to understand how is Ledger thinking about the Lightning Network itself, uh, you know, in terms of interacting with the Bitcoin Network. Okay, oh, that, that was a, a question for, for Jan. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, actually, what I can say, I, I don't know what, what, I, what I can say on, on that topic. Sure. Personally, I, I, I like uh, the, the concept of, of Lightning and so on. We have one. We work closely with uh, with uh, companies working on uh, on Lightning, and uh, we will do uh, something on, on Lightning soon. But uh, this is uh, like uh, not public stuff, so I, I cannot uh, answer more than, than this. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> no worries. I, I hope we'll find out soon. All right. Okay. Uh, so uh, I think that's a wrap. Thank you so much, uh, JB, for uh, doing this, and thanks to Rod for organizing. Thanks to Ian, who's not with us, but uh, for, for the opening note. Um, and yeah, uh, I think we can we can wrap it up here. Yeah, it was a, a pleasure for me. Thanks for for the invitation and uh, and for your attention. Thank you.